make sure. Okay, we got that going. And there's Jeremy. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining in here. Uh, this morning's uh, talk is uh, given by uh, it is the Reverend Jeremy Cato Thotland. And we know better as Jeremy. So uh, he's been practicing at MZMC since 2014 and was ordained by Ted O'Toole in 2019. His focus is on experiential practice, living Zen off the cushion, and living a service-oriented life. He finds Zen practice fulfilling and difficult and totally worth it. He's happy to share his experience with others. He grew up and currently lives in Minneapolis with his partner, Andrea, dog, Juniper, and cat, Turk. So, welcome, Jeremy. All right. Thank you, Carl. Thanks, everyone. Uh, this is my, my first talk outside of my home practice center of uh, MZMC. So thanks for having me. Uh, you didn't know what you were getting into, but here we go. Uh, and thanks to Susan and, and Dokai also for inviting me. Um, I want to start out with a I'm, I'm, I'm down at Hokioji today, as a matter of fact. I just thought I would uh, pop down here. We're having a retreat later in the week, and I thought I would pop down and and uh, give the talk from Hokioji, which here we are, kind of together separately. Um, but it also reminded me of the land that we're on here, and I wanted to do a little land acknowledgement uh, that Hokioji in, in southern Minnesota is on uh, land that was originally peopled by the Ocheti, <clears throat> Sakawan Sioux, and the Sak, Meskwaki, and Dakota people. Um, I don't really know, I, I've, I've never done a land acknowledgement myself, and I don't know how to really say thank you or say I'm sorry or uh, what to do. But the questions that I have around this are how do we honor uh how do we honor them how do we honor the land that we're on and how do we honor this connection then that we have together with them um my hope is that we can remember them uh that we can take care of the land that we're on here which uh, we do a good job i think doing um i hope that we can take care of our lives to honor this connection because they're our ancestors they're part of our ancestry. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today uh, is more, more particularly than just the wide ancestry that we're kind of used to in Zen, but particularly the women ancestors that we have. Um, so I'm going to talk firstly about why I want to talk about the women ancestors. And then uh, I'll go through just a few of them, point some out and uh, I have a couple of visuals with me. So a bit of a caveat, once I, I started talking about this, I, I realized that I'm quite, uh, quite clumsy about uh, the phrases that I use and the words that I use to talk about uh, patriarchy and uh, th this, these, all the, the feelings and thoughts that I have around the women ancestors. Um, but I think that it's best that we don't wait to be skillful masters before we engage in something. Um, I don't know about you, but if I would have waited to be a skillful master to sit meditation or to talk about anything in Zen, I wouldn't have done either. So I might not say things that are, uh, great or appropriate or skillful, um, but I am learning and I want to learn more. And if something comes up uh, that you find offensive or that you find uh, you want to talk to me about, uh, you can feel free to, to call me out publicly or privately, um, whatever it takes. I just want to uh, learn and I'm eager for feedback. So for me, 
it's hard to talk about the the women ancestors without talking about why I'm talking about women ancestors uh, instead of just our Zen ancestors in general. It's hard for me not to talk about women ancestors and not uh, talk about all the systems of oppression and injustice that we have that are really uh, many of them that are tied tightly together. Um, but this one is particularly concerning uh, patriarchy. And it's hard for me not to talk about the women ancestors because these systems are still thriving today. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons um, that this talk has come up for me is because in the last few months, I've had conversations and heard Dharma talks where women are reporting uh, that they are being ignored, uh, that they are being talked over and mocked or treated like they don't know what they're talking about, treated like they're emotional or even crazy. Um, and this, most of this is from actual women teachers uh, happening today. This, this is, this really, uh, I'm listening to them and I'm hearing them and hearing their experiences. Um, and as a, a white cisgendered straight male, um, uh, it hasn't been my experience to have these things happen. So actually listening to these experiences, listening to my partner, Andrea, report on things and listening to my friends and my wide Zen family report on things has expanded my world exponentially. And some of that expansion includes a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. So I am uh, in, in a lot of ways, I'm heartbroken. In a lot of ways, I've, I've been ashamed. Um, in a lot of ways, I'm very angry about this. Uh, so this is something that has a lot of energy for me. I'm listening to these emotions that are coming up and really paying attention to them and finding what it is uh, that is that, that makes it just feel so wrong. Uh, So some questions that I have around this is, is how, how in the world is a practice that is devoted to enlightenment and equanimity and non-dualism, how is this practice managed to perpetuate uh, such a split between the genders? I mean, doesn't Zen teach that there's no difference, there's no other? It teaches a oneness, it teaches an emptiness. And doesn't it include all beings and all practice? And I think that this uh, has a lot of habit energy and has a lot of karma, this being uh, the systemic marginalization of women and women teachers. And we're still dealing with that. We're dealing with that. For me, it seems like it's the waters that I'm swimming in uh, that I can't tell that this is what I'm, I'm in until I've gotten that other perspective. And now that I've gotten that other perspective, I can examine these things and say, hey, what is it? What is it that's going on? Um, I believe that we have the capacity to examine these things really carefully. And in Zen, we have this kind of duty to do that, that we're, uh, we're sitting and we're paying attention and then we can make different choices. So we have the capacity to change these things, working with uh, these emotions that are coming up, being with them, just letting them sit and not turning away from intense feelings that, uh, as, as a white male, I don't necessarily have to pay attention to, but I do have to pay attention to it because we are not separate. We are not you and me. We're not two and we're not one. And I found that 
being with these emotions and being with these things that come up around specifically patriarchy, I, I'm not doing it to make myself feel better. But what does happen is that when I am sitting with, with a bunch of anger, I'm sitting with a bunch of shame, I'm changing my relationship to it. And this change of relationship happens automatically. So no matter what comes up here, I want to take what I've learned from some of these women, these women that I've known and these women that I've learned about, and really uh, whatever is coming up, hold it very gently and hold ourselves gently uh, in this process. It's part of how I am able to uh, ask for feedback and how I'm able to learn is if I can just be gentle about it. Um, and it doesn't always mean that the feelings are gentle and doesn't always mean that the feedback is gentle, but it does mean that I can uh, open up and have the capacity to gently hold all these things. So I see uh, in the Hope Yoji chant book that we have a, a lineage of women ancestors that's similar to the one at MCMC. It's a little different, but it's a lineage of women ancestors that was put together only in the last couple decades. It's not something that's been around for a long time. Uh, and this was work that was done by uh, women and men and adopted into the Soto Zen organization in the West called the S Soto Zen Buddhist Association, SCBA. Um, and from then, I think uh, some Zen centers had put together this list before and were uh, kind of disseminating that among Zen centers. And I don't know at Hokyoji how many times this is chanted at MZMC, it's chanted on Saturday. Uh, we do the, the list of male ancestors and then we do the list of female ancestors. And the the list of uh, male ancestors is, is a lineage from teacher to student which may not be entirely uh, factual. It may not, uh, they may have some fictional characters in there. Um, and I think for the, it, it, but in, uh, the way that it shows up for me in, in intent is a passing of uh, Buddha mind from teacher to student all the way down to where we are today. And the list of women it is less of a transfer from teacher to student of a Buddha mind. And what I like to think of it as kind of transferring, it's not even a transfer, it's just a, like a lineage of heart, a lineage of heart of practice. And this list of women uh, are taken from different sources. They're taken from the Tarigata, they're taken from uh, sutras, they're, taking, they're taken from um, uh, writings that we found, uh, they're taken from some that were uh, established their own centers. They're taken from uh, more modernly, they're taken from people that we admire as having done great things. Um, and there's not a lot of information about all these women. So when I was looking, now I found some more books since I since I originally dove into this, um, I've taken some classes and uh, things, and I've learned more that uh, there actually is a, a good bit of information about some of these women. Although uh, when we think of male ancestors and uh, the kind of careful curation of their work and things like that, uh, the the curation of women's poems and women's writings and women's teachings seems a little more accidental to me. So in this list, um, we have women from India. It starts out uh, with, with women from India, then uh, through China into Japan, all the way up to the near present. So we have kind of a long list of um, time 
like the male lineage list it is a long list through time. Um, we've had women that uh, have studied under men, women have taught uh, men, women that became students and that came went on to establish their own centers. Uh, we have women that ordained but then stayed home to take care of their household or take care of their family or even just to support themselves. Um, just like men, we have women that were hermits and women that were uh, very powerful and, and very influential. And that I also want to acknowledge uh, in, in both of our chant books, there's a line that says, um, women's names that have been left unsung. So there are many women that are not on the list. Um, a lot of these women gave up positions of privilege, positions of power. They endured great losses, losing whole families, losing loved ones, uh, sometimes losing their own country. We have women that scarred their face because they weren't allowed to practice because they were too beautiful. They were told that they were too beautiful to ordain and they were turned away. And so they physically marred themselves so that they could be acceptable to men to be allowed to practice, to be allowed to ordain. We have women that uh, supported convents and individuals. And to me, what I feel uh, is a great teaching. And sometimes uh, I feel it is something that we've lost and are now regaining are teachings that touch on everydayness. How the world uh, works for people of that work in a family, for people that go to work. Um, teachings that express feelings, that express those losses, uh, that express the things that they were going through every day, hunger, thirst, cold, hot, you know, just the, the kind of things that we, we sit with here, but uh, that we don't always talk about. And so for me, this shows the practical side of Zen. It shows how to be in the world, how to work and be in family, uh, the family of our, our origin or the family of our Sangha. And not just be secluded in a monastery and not just having monastery practice and not just having uh, a sitting practice, but taking that sitting practice off the cushion, taking that sitting practice with us every moment of every day. and feeling these, living these, living a deep and really fulfilling life. So I'm completely inspired by uh, what women had to do to practice back, uh, I'm gonna say back in the day, uh, because I, I can't really know what they had to do, but these stories uh, that I've read are very inspiring. Uh, each of them is a very good example and inspiration of practice. And we don't really see a lot of examples of that in, in the male dominated literature and the sutras that I read, there's a lot of talk about compassion. Uh, and I have a sense that, that there, there is compassion. There's compassion somewhere and we're supposed to be compassionate. But to me, uh, I wonder what the heck does that look like? What does compassion actually mean? What does it what action does compassion take? Which is kind of a koan for me, but at the same time, in these teachings of the women uh, that are our ancestors, I do see what compassion looks like, how compassion is lived in and out. Uh, so some of the visuals that I have, uh, this list, boy, <laughs> so we've got uh, this nice list of, uh, it's a nice circle of women ancestors. Um, I can't quite remember where I found these. 
Um, here's one with bamboo. And then one, one with kind of like a river, a river of ancestors. And these are all the names uh, that are in the Hokioji chant book and more, quite a bit more. Uh, and if, if you ever want to explore those and try to find uh, a little more about them, there's, the, like I said, there's more and more information coming out about them. I don't know. Uh, I just think that it, it takes effort to, to find these things. So one of the uh, women on the list, the first woman on the list actually is Mahapajapati. And Mahapajapati was uh, the aunt of Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, and shortly after childbirth, uh, the Buddha's mom had died and Mahapajapati raised the Buddha. And so it was basically his stepmom and his aunt. And shortly after Buddha's enlightenment, uh, Mahapajapati started following the Buddha and wanted to be ordained. And the Buddha denied, uh, denied her ordination. And the story goes that she asked three times at three different times. Um, and even the third time she showed up uh, with a, a retinue of, of 500 nuns and asked for ordination. And the Buddha said no. And Ananda said, well, didn't you say that all beings can do this, whether they're male or female? and achieve enlightenment and he said yes and he said well then let's let's do it and buddha said okay so finally he said okay but he said okay but there's eight special rules and if you want to be ordained you have to agree to these eight rules So I'll, ju I'll just read through the, the, list, the list of these eight rules. I'll give you my opinion in a second. So a nun who has been ordained for a century must bow to a monk who has been ordained for a day. A nun must not spend the meditation season in a place where there are no monks. Every 15 days, the nuns must ask the monks for the date of the observance day and must ask to give the nuns a teaching. After the meditation se season, a nun must tell her faults to both the orders of monks and the orders of nuns. If a nun commits a grave error, she must submit herself to the scrutiny of both orders for 15 days. A nun can obtain full ordination from both orders only after she has observed the six precepts during two years as a postulant. A nun must never scold a monk and nuns cannot teach the monks, but monks can teach the nuns. So this is kind of a baseline set of rules that I feel uh, really influenced why the teaching of women have been missing from the, the larger spectrum of Buddhist teachings. I feel that we still see these effects of these rules even today. And what would practice look like if they had been equally ordained and equally uh, venerated and equally listened to? It's been 2,500 years. I can't, I can't imagine the, the changes that have happened in the last 80 years, 100 years, let alone 2,500 years. But I do think that we're starting to see some of these changes in the West, this Zen that we've inherited from Japan, that we're made turning into American Zen. I think that this, uh, this is beginning to happen, but it's so intertwined with a lot of other things, with our personal culture here in the West, with the cultures 
of the countries that these uh, the Buddhism has come through. I'll also say that uh, Dogen, the founder of Soto Zen, had women students and treated them as equals, as far as I can tell. Um, and somewhere along the line, uh, the Soto school had fallen away from that and reinstituted rules like this and said that nuns could not be fully ordained and they couldn't teach and they couldn't head a temple. And that was changed just in the early, late 18, early, early 1900s. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So a ways down the list, uh, our first Chinese uh, matriarch is Zongxi, Zongxi Daosho. Uh, and she lived about 550 uh, in the common era. And she might have been the sister of a Chinese king. She might have been the daughter of Emperor Wu. Uh, that's a little fuzzy. Um, but what we do know, what we think we know, is that she was a student of Bodhidharma. And she's one of the four uh, people that Bodhidharma asked for verification of expression of the, of the teachings. And her understanding was she said now my understanding now is that it is like the joy of seeing the buddha land it is felt at the first glance but not the second my understanding now is that it is like the joy of seeing the buddha land it is felt at the first glance but not the second and bodhidharma answered her you have my flesh So while he did not give direct uh, transmission and teaching authority as far as what our lineage says, Zhangxi fully understood and had the flesh of the teachings all the way. Also, we have uh, Kojima Kendo. Uh, and she's a recent figure that lived from 1898 to 1994. She just passed away in 94. And by all accounts, she was a great leader of uh, women Zen practitioners. She fought the, the Soto school for rights to be fully ordained and to be fully transmitted and to lead temples. Um, and I've learned recently that she uh, was allowed to conduct ceremony at Eheji, which she was the first woman to ever conduct a ceremony at Eheji. That's a long time not to have a woman conduct a ceremony. Um, somebody not on the list, I have some people not on the list, somebody that I didn't know directly, uh, Tomoe Katagiri. I think she's had a great influence in our practice here, uh, teaching us sewing, learning, supporting Zen Center through the entire time that she was there. And uh, I know at Hokioji, we honor her with the Retired Leadership Fund, and uh, she has a special place here at Hokioji. Uh, she has a special place in the practice of Zen in Minnesota, I think. And then I also want to mention some current teachers who I feel embody compassionate practice and show it in their lives. Uh, these people have influenced me and the way that I practice and inform. Uh, I, I just don't think that I would uh, have a kind of practice that I have today without them. Uh, Susan, thank you. Uh, she showed me that it's okay to care for myself. And that caring for myself is caring for all beings. Rosemary Taylor, uh, who teaches sewing at MZMC, taught me what samurai Zen was. Ooh, samurai Zen. Sit, quiet. And she also showed me what the balm for samurai Zen was. And to say no, and it's okay. 
the balm being irreverence and laughter. Don't take this stuff so seriously. It's only life. Um, and somebody that I met here through Hokyoji Myo'on, uh, she always has this great love in her voice. And she always has this energy around her, just in her presence. And uh, I've, I've come to love her very much. There's, of course, many more women that have influenced my practice um, and many more women teachers now than there had been um, 40, 50 years ago. So I have a, a voice in my head uh, that informs my Dharma talks a lot, and that is uh, a voice of one of my sangha that says, okay, so what? So what, now what? What do we do? Well, my opinion on that is that the Dharma is in all things. It's, it's just, it's the Dharma. It doesn't matter who's teaching the Dharma. Everything, everything, everything is our teacher. Everybody is our teacher. It's in all forms. Listen to it. Can we see past these forms? Can we see what they're saying? Can we stop our judging and our fearfulness and accept the teaching from whatever the source? Can we really look at them with acceptance? And these sources can be Besides people, they can be inanimate objects, they can be ideas, they can be emotions. All these things are great teachers. And if something has come up, if something has caused some anger or some irritation or joy, great. That's awesome. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at what, what's coming up. Let's be with it and let's learn from it. What is it telling you? It doesn't always tell you what you think it does, but it's telling you something. So letting it arise, letting it speak, listening to it. A friend of mine told me that um, I'm going to have to paraphrase. I'm not a great quoter. Uh, patriarchy will not be undone by the efforts of women. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's important to, to talk about women teachers and to talk about our feelings around that and to really uh, encounter that and be face to face with it. Because how do, we, how do we hold all that stuff? And it makes a difference. How do we hold if we have anger or shame around that? I used to have a lot of shame around being a, a white man. And through working with it and holding that shame, it's not as strong. And when there's heartbreak, when there's anger, when there's joy, experience it, feel it, let it be, hold it, be gentle with it, be gentle with yourself. Is there something there to, that we can learn? That's all I have prepared today. Thank you for your kind attention. And uh, I don't know what we normally do here, Carl, if we can open it up for discussion or questions, or if you have some other part of the program you need to do, you can do that. No. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got time for some questions, if there are any. I'm going to, uh, let's see, switch to the gallery view so I can see everybody. Uh, 
If there's a question, please uh, raise your hand. I can see you. Aha. Well, Jeremy, you've left everyone without a question. So we'll move on to announcements here. Uh, let's see. Next week, Ryushin, Jan Fryer, you're going to be giving a talk for us. Is that, uh, that's what's on the schedule. Is that what your understanding is? Then? <laughs> Ryushin, yeah, maybe not. Uh, it's not on my schedule, but I can do it in a week, yeah. Um, well, we can talk about that later. Anyway, um, thanks for joining. And as uh, Jeremy said, uh, we've got MZMC coming on uh, Tuesday for a six-day uh, uh, contemporary retreat. And that's going to get followed up. By, let's see, we've got the Hokioji Men's Retreat coming up in October. Uh, we've got a couple of outside groups coming. There's a, a just sitting retreat in November. Uh, and that's uh, sold out. And I think we've got a, another uh, body, mind, uh, tai chi, yoga uh, retreat coming up in, in November also. And then we've got, uh, in October, we've got a caring for the land weekend, which is uh, no charge to anybody. If you want to come and help us uh, do some outdoor projects, that would be great. And uh, after Thanksgiving, we've got a uh, work weekend where we get Hokioji ready for the, the wintertime. So uh, let's see. I think that's all that I have here. So we will close with the four vows. So thank you. Beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Thank you. And have a good week. All right. Bye-bye.